Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being with us this week for the playing of the 2021 PGA Championship. As we get back to our regular May date, um, before we tee off on Thursday morning at 7 o'clock, we want to make sure you have some quality time with the PGA of America President Jim Richardson, CEO Seth Waugh, and Chief Championships Officer Kerry Haig. Jim, let's go ahead and begin with you. This is always a very special week in golf and the sports world, but there's a little something different about this year's championship, isn't there? Yeah, thanks, Julius. Uh, obviously, the last year has been really challenging for everyone in the country. You know, in this event, it's our championship, and we like to treat it as our 28,000 are like family, and our players and our champions are like family. So, you know, first and foremost, we're missing two of our champions this year. Uh, Two-time PGA champion Vijay Singh had to pull out, and four-time PGA champion Tiger Woods won't be here. You know, we wish them both a speedy recovery. Hopefully, Vijay's feels well enough to play next week in the KitchenAid Senior PGA in Tulsa. Uh, and we all hope that Tiger has a healthy and speedy recovery and, and gets back to you know, being 100% as a father. And, and hopefully we see him back out on the tour and our events uh, later this year. But um, you know, last year was a big challenge for the entire industry. 2020 at Harding Park was a really interesting PGA championship. You know, Kerry Haig and his team did an unbelievable job. Uh, in a lot of respects, it, it may have been our most successful PGA Championship, uh, being able to pull it off in the way that uh, Kerry and the team and the PGA did um, in that type of environment. Uh, fast forwarding to today, we're here at the Ocean Course at Kiwa. You know, unbelievable amount of work and the team that put it together. And really have to thank uh, you know the owner, uh, Bill Goodwin here of Kiwa Island Golf Resort. You know, Roger Warren, who's the president of the resort, who's a PGA member past president of our association, Brian Gerard, the director of golf operations, Jeff Stone, the superintendent, who's just got the golf course in phenomenal condition. I think you've heard that from players already this week, uh, how firm and fast and what a test the ocean course is going to be this week. Um, you know, in our Carolinas PGA, the section here that, that covers uh, the state, uh, uh, both North and South Carolina, uh, almost 1,800 PGA members and the job that they're doing uh, as part of this championship um, and all the work that they're doing you know to grow the game uh, has been unbelievable so even though we we had to adjust like everybody did uh, this past year you know we saw golf really kind of bounce back in record numbers uh, rounds of golf were up 14 percent year over year we had over a half a million new juniors that got introduced to the game and our 28,000 men and women around the country were at the forefront of that you know introducing and inviting new players into the game and keeping them engaged as we move forward into 2021. So there's, there was a, a lot that we had to deal with as an association, as an industry this past year, a lot to be proud of. And then we uh, you know, are now here today for the 2021 PGA back in May. Um, and we got some exciting things. Our, our week kicked off yesterday with our PGA Hope Secretaries Cup, uh, which if you're not aware, Hope stands for helping our patriots everywhere. We've got hundreds of PGA members around the country that are involved in that program. It's the only golf program for veterans that actually is approved by the VA as rehabilitation. So it's not just teaching them golf, but it's helping with life skills and kind of acclimating back into society. And when you hear those veterans talk about how much that program means to them, how it saved their life, how it saved their relationships and their marriages, it's pretty powerful to think that the game of golf is utilized in a way to do that is, is pretty special. And then, of course, this week, uh, it's about our championship, our major, and part of that is our team of 20, our 20 PGA club professionals that qualify for this championship. We're very proud of the work that they do and representing all 28,000, uh, not only you know, operating and teaching and coaching the game at the highest level, but uh, playing the game at the highest level. So uh, you know, kind of led by our, our champion, Omar Uresti, and we've got some other really skilled players, uh, Danny Balin, for instance, or... Uh, Rob LeBretz uh, are both playing in their eighth PGA Championship. Uh, they're great players. Uh, Rob made the cut uh, at uh, Beth Page Black a couple years ago, so we're looking forward to cheering that team of 20 on and hopefully seeing them play on the weekend as well too. So, uh, you know, we've had a lot that's gone on the last year. Uh, the entire staff of the PGA of America led by Seth and the championship team led by Kerry uh, and really our 28,000 men and women have bounced back and I think really helped drive the industry forward. We're seeing those rounds continue to uh, you know, be at record numbers uh, into 2021. 
and uh, hopefully we'll be able to shine a spotlight this week, not only on the greatest players in the game, but also on some of the great work that's being done by PGA members around the country. Jim, I, I also know you're really excited about a new programming element that we're yeah. launching this week. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, the PGA Coaching Live and the Coaching Channel, for the very first time, you know, we have it on the driving range. So from today through Friday, that'll be uh, on PGA.com as well as ESPN+. Plus. Uh, but some of the best coaches in the country, uh, really analyzing, you know, the best players in the world, but also how to help the recreational golfer, the everyday golfer. You know, we have our, our teacher of the year, Mark Blackburn, We've got uh, professionals like Joanna Coe, uh, Joe Hallett, uh, Rich Jones, and then Colin Morikawa's coach, you know, who helped him to a major victory last year. You know, Rick uh, Cessna House is here as well, too. So he's been splitting time between the golf course with Colin, obviously, getting, his, uh, getting him ready to defend this year, but also giving tips to the recreational golfer, but also analyzing the best players in the world. So this is something we've already gotten a lot of positive response back from our PGA members. Uh, from members of clubs and golfers around the country talking about how this is going to help them in their everyday game. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to watch the best players in the world this week, but also get some tips that will help their game as well. Jim, golf has seen a huge rise in popularity and rounds played over the last year as a result of the pandemic. And that increase has raised a huge demand for more employees within the industry. How can the PGA of America help? Yeah, well, it is a large industry, you know, $84 billion industry. Over 2 million jobs are created by the golf industry. We've seen, as you said, you know, we talked about record numbers this past year, uh, not only in rounds of golf, but club sales and uh, the industry as a whole is in a really positive place. And, you know, now it's really our job to keep those new golfers engaged, keep them playing the game. Uh, but it's also a great thing to get involved with. You know, we have 18 PGM universities and colleges around the country that offer uh, a professional golf management program, and it's a great time to get into golf as an industry. You know, people that are involved in the industry are very passionate about golf, very passionate about growing the game, uh, and right now it's a great time to get involved. Uh, the industry's thriving. Uh, we're looking to hire very qualified young men and women or those that are looking for second career. So we'd love nothing better if somebody's excited about the game and wants to get involved and make it a career. Uh, we have opportunities either through our partnerships with the university programs or just through uh, PGA of America itself. So there's, uh, it's a great industry with a lot of great people and a lot of really passionate people. And the PGA professional is a big part of that. Um, so we'd love to invite those that are interested in getting involved in the game to play it. Uh, interested in going into it as a career or interested to be involved in any way possible, we've got opportunities and options for them. We've got our own career services department at the PG of America, you know, led by Scott Kimmick and the team, and, and they're doing great work in elevating the status of PGA members into general manager positions, executive positions in the industry. Uh, we have PGA members going into the media, so all aspects. And our career services department's worked really hard over the last couple of years. Uh, to offer that to different companies and golf courses around the country. Uh, but uh, we'd like to invite anybody from any type of background, if you're interested in getting into the game to play it, or as a business or as a job, uh, welcome aboard. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks very much, Jim. Seth, as, 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 as Jim pointed out, it's been a very busy year already up to this point, not to mention a Ryder Cup coming at us in September. But I know there's another initiative that you're very proud of. Yeah, first of all, I just want to say hello. <laughs> it's kind of nice to be back with human beings in, a, in this beautiful place. So, you know, I think we're all sort of smiling a little extra. This, it's kind of a, as I said earlier, it's sort of a coming out party, if you will, for, for the game. Um, and we're excited about that. We're, as Jim said, we're really proud of what we pulled off last year. Um, and I think we were smart about how we did a lot of things. But uh, as an industry, and as well as us, uh, and we want to be smart on the way back out. And you saw that we've you know, try to be as responsive to, you know, literally situations that are changing every day uh, in terms of CDC recommendations, et cetera, et cetera, to, to have here. And so it's going to be, you know, <laughs> this is an amazing site. As Jim said, we have great friends here. You know, all you got to do is walk on, and it's like a happy pill. Uh, and, um, and, you know, we, last year, when we put tickets on sale here, we uh, sold out in a week. Um, uh, you know, Monday after uh, Harding Park, and we were we were out of tickets uh, by the end of the week. So we're disappointed we couldn't fill all those requests, but we're uh, we're proud of you know sort of what we're carrying team are pulling off. So it looks like we're going to have 
you know, amazing weather. Uh, the golf course, is, as Jim said, I've talked to, I don't know, 25, 30 players, all of whom are gushing about what uh, uh, Jeff and Kerry and his team have put together here. And now my job is just to stay out of the way and let Kerry, <laughs> Kerry do his thing. Uh, and, uh, and we know, you know, again, as, as Jim said last year, was maybe his finest moment and our, our most significant championship in the sense that we were the first major back, really the first sporting event that mattered. Uh, and what he pulled off on Sunday uh, was amazing. Uh, obviously, the players <laughs> helped, but uh, it, you know we hope to have that same sort of theater uh, again this year, and hopefully a playoff, right, Kerry? If we can, we can pull that off. Um, you know, as I said, it was a it was a long, hard year, but we faced, we entered the the, the crisis, if you will with a concept that if we could, you know, be both smart and human um, and sort of try to get everybody to the other side of this thing, that, that we could actually come out of it stronger in, in a variety of ways. Um, you know, not necessarily financially, though we've, we've uh, done uh, well there to shore up things, uh, but more importantly with our brand and our relationships and our culture. Uh, and I'd say that that is not only true across um, the PGA of America, but I think across the industry because of how we worked about work together, which I'll really get to uh, Julius's question in a second. By the way, if everybody thought I was going to talk less because you had me stand up, it's not working. Okay. <laughs> So, um, you know, we started out with, you know, sort of Jim talked about the members. We're so proud of what they did. You know, if you think about it, and I don't want to be overly dramatic, but they were the frontline workers, right? And, and we had this concept that golf could be part of the solution rather than the problem. And we had, um, working with Jeff Price, who's in the back, and John Easterbrook, our head of a membership, we had a back-to-golf program which followed CDC guidelines. We approached the CDC and, um, and said, we think we can be, you know, part of the solution here, uh, which they totally agreed with and re you know, reintroduce golf through the industry um, back um, to playing, right? And then I'm really proud of the industry in terms of, you know, what Jay did in terms of being the first sport really back and on television when he was talking about playing in June and May, I think everybody thought he was crazy and yet he, pull he pulled it off, we pulled it off as an industry and worked together to create a schedule. We tried to help the most in need and we created an emergency relief fund which gave, you know, uh, about $8 million to uh, those in the industry that were most in need. Um, and we also wanted to approach every one of our partners and say, okay, well, how do, you know, what, what problems do you have? How can we help? And they were great partners to us and we think we were great partners to them and creating generational relationships. So every one of those partners has stuck with us. Every one of them is here in some form this week. Uh, and we've added some, notably uh, Rolex has come back into the family to uh, sports. So, you know, not only did we, you know, uh, take advantage of, of, of a crisis, if you will, but we, we've um, come out of it, you know, sort of stronger uh, than we went into it. Um, the other thing that's really uh, happened is, uh, is the industry has come together. We've sort of coined the phrase Golf Inc. And, you know, it was sort of, we can accomplish a whole lot more together. We're sort of the, the, the board of directors of the game, if you will. And um, there's lots of things that we can do together. So last June, uh, as golf was sort of coming back, and, and as Jim said, we were starting to see this kind of wild participation growth uh, fueled by our members. Um, we, I made a call to Jay and to Mike Wan and said, look, we have, both an opportunity and an obligation to do two things. One is, if let's assume Tiger burst on the scene, you know, now, what would we do differently that we didn't do 20 years ago to make sure that that was generational growth as opposed to, you know, six months of fame, right? And um, and so, how do we grow it? How do we sustain this growth? How do we make it not a year of golf but a, a decade of golf, if you will? Uh, and then number two is how do we make the game look different than it has, right? How do we make it look more like the world so that maybe the world will behave a little bit more like the game? And so uh, it was right in the height of the social justice you know, sort of um, movement that, that has sprung. And since then, we've, we, we convened a call with uh, all sorts of industry players, um, club manufacturers, uh, management companies, uh, you know, all the other golf bodies, and from that we've, we've created six work streams um, that are looking at everything in the game to make it both grow and, 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 uh, and get more inclusive um, uh, as well. Uh, and so there's, you know, procurement, there's employment, there's a marketing campaign, there's all sorts of things, and from that a number of things have happened. Um, last week or two weeks ago, we held what is called our, our uh, PGA Collegiate Works Championship. Uh, it is uh, the old, essentially, HBCU um, national championship. Uh, we have 
owned it for 20 years or so. When it, when it struggled, we took it on, and we've done really good things with it, created a job fair, kept it alive, hosted it at our um, home in Port St. Lucie. Uh, but we thought we could, we could elevate it. And uh, we talked to uh, our friends at Comcast, who's come into a, as a partner both on the broadcast side as well as financially, uh, and the tour uh, as well, who hosted it at TPC Sawgrass. So these kids got that opportunity. They had a job fair at the, um, at the new world headquarters uh, of the tour. And it, it we're opening eyes um, to, to what Jim referred to, which is an $85 billion industry with two million jobs. You don't have to play it to be in it. There's, there's all sorts of other things you can do. And the idea there is to elevate it around, um, around this event to ultimately, uh, hopefully, um, you know, do a lot towards uh, endowing HBCU golf programs uh, around the country. So exciting stuff that's going on. The industry is, is working you know, hugely well together. Uh, we have a marketing campaign that you'll see soon, which is called Make Golf Your Thing. Uh, we think that uh, will also you know, kind of elevate um, how to play the game in, in all forms. It's not 18 holes as a measurement anymore. It's sort of, you know, if you went to Top Golf, you played three holes or nine holes or, you know, took, you know swung in a mirror, uh, that's golf. And, and how do you do it in whatever um, sort of digestible form uh, that there is. So we're excited about where we're going. Um, we think the industry has, again, never been more aligned um, towards doing this together. Uh, we obviously have our mission is to serve our members and, and grow the game. Uh, but now we've got a lot of company uh, doing that and, and uh, hugely excited about it. And you know, from a Ryder Cup perspective, um, we, uh, you know, we're excited about, you know, obviously we've worked with the industry last year to postpone it for a year. Uh, we have every hope and every desire, and, um, and we're working very hard to make it an absolute full fan experience. Uh, you know, we're working, obviously, with the state and local governments to have all those conversations. It'll be fluid, uh, but our plan is to have uh, a Ryder Cup uh, in a way, you know, have it be the greatest Ryder Cup in history, right? I think the world, as we're seeing this, is, is ready to have a party. Uh, the Olympics is, you know, going to happen, it looks like, but, but not in the way that you would hope it would. Uh, and so this is really going to be the first time to cheer for your country, uh, to have that sort of tribal, uh, in person anyway, to have that tribal sort of um, uh, atmosphere that is so important. And so, you know, we're hopeful that, um, that you know, September will be, uh, you know, one of the great events in golf and a great sort of exclamation point to the end of this uh, thing. Uh, we think it's all going to happen fast from here, certainly from a U.S. perspective. I realize the world has, still has a lot of challenges out there, but from a U.S. perspective, we're, we're really hopeful we'll be able to pull it off. Yeah. Thank you very much, Seth. Kerry, you were here 30 years ago setting up this golf course for the Ryder Cup. Since then, a lot of other major championships. The one thing that remained constant was the discussion about the wind uh, out here. What can the best men's players in the world expect this week? Yeah, well, thanks, Julius. And firstly, it, it's an honor to return to the Ocean Course. Uh, some great memories here, starting with the Ryder Cup. We've had our PGA Professional Championship here, uh, KitchenAid Senior PGA Championship, and two PGA Championships. And, uh, you know, what a great golf course. I think it's probably one of the most difficult golf courses in the country. Um, Pete and Alice Dye did an unbelievable job designing it. And uh, I'm sure Pete's looking down on us and uh, excited for what is coming ahead this week. Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am. I think the golf course is just in beautiful condition. Jeff Stone, superintendent, and all his team have done an unbelievable job preparing this golf course for what I hope and we hope will be the, you know, one of the most interesting, challenging, and exciting championships we've ever had. Uh, forecast, uh, obviously we've got a pretty good forecast and hopefully that remains. Uh, and one of the fun things or potentially good things about that is we're gonna have this, potentially this east wind for a couple of days and then it may switch to the west, totally 180 degree switch, which if it does, again, Pete and Alice will be just lapping it up. And that's in part why they designed this golf course as they did. 7,800 yards is certainly the longest golf course in uh, championship history, but 
They designed it for that reason. So because of the wind and the effects it had, downwind, you know, Pete was the first to say, yeah, you need plenty of length. But into the wind, you have that ability. They built enough tees, enough teeing options for us to, you know, give some variety and, uh, you know, make it playable for the players. Uh, so could not be more excited. Um, as we have in previous championships, uh, the sandy areas will not be bunkers. And we've notified all the players of that. Um, so players will be able to take practice swings um, out of the sand areas. It's part of the general area. Uh, but if a ball is embedded in that sand, there is no relief from the loose sand. So uh, we've notified the players and the caddies of that, and hopefully they're plenty aware of it, as they were at our previous championships. Uh, Distance measuring devices, uh, we are allowing for the first time in the PGA Championship. We have allowed them for a number of years in our other championships. Uh, we feel potentially here it can certainly help if you hit the ball offline, which occasionally could happen, that uh, potentially will help the speed of play in those circumstances. But obviously we realize, uh, you know, the yardage book and the other information that uh, the caddies and the players uh, learn over the practice rounds will still be just as important as it ever was. But now it's part of the rules of golf to be able to use them. Uh, we think now is the time to, to, to allow it at the PGA Championship. And finally, you know, we're, we're proud of the strength of our field. 99 of the top 100 players in the world once again are playing here uh, in the championship. And it's something we pride ourselves on at the PGA Championship that we have the strongest field as measured by the official World Golf Rankings. And uh, uh, it's a great field. Uh, hopefully we can set the golf course up in a way that challenges the best players in the world. And I can't wait for Thursday morning to start and see how the best players in the world play this magnificent golf course. Kerry, thank you very much. We'll go ahead and go to the Q&A right now. We'll begin at the Ocean Course on microphone number four, Jeff. Harry, you talk about the difficulty of this golf course. Could you address a little bit of the difficulty of setting it up and just the many challenges that come here with the shifting conditions? Yeah, well, uh, great question, yeah. I'd say uh, I certainly get to know our weather team who are on site very well <laughs> and talk with them every night before we sort of set up for the next day and then every morning because, as you know, these winds can shift around during the day. and. All you can do is make your best effort and best estimate on how you're going to set it up based on the information that we have. And that's exactly how we always do it. We'll try and do it fairly with all the information that we have. And, uh, you know, to your point, it's, 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 you've got to take into consideration every aspect that's out there. And, you know, part of Pete's design, as I say, he, he has tees that are there and available for us to use based on those forecasts. Kerry always wanted to run a British Open. <laughs> uh, we're still at the ocean course. Mr. Murray on mic number eight. Seth, I, I appreciate you, you issued a statement two weeks ago, but the kind of Super League topic has still rumbled on as we, really? approach, as we approach this tournament. <laughs> um, could I please just ask you to expand and articulate on why you think that project is troublesome for the game or bad for the game? And, um, what your kind of wider thoughts on it are. Yeah, sure. Let me just reiterate our statement first, um, and then I'll talk a little bit, you know, personally, uh, uh, probably have a little different perspective than some that have been in the game, I guess, forever. Um, first of all, you know, I think we were pretty clear, but, uh, but our view is that the ecosystem of the game works very well. It's never worked better uh, that, you know, the partnerships that exist with ourselves, with the tour, with the European tour, um, and really all the golf bodies are, are strong. Um, it's not perfect. I don't think you design, you know, the, the, the today, if you were doing it today, you wouldn't have all these bodies, but it doesn't mean you can't um, make it very functional and, and work well. And so, you know, if, if someone wants to play on a Ryder Cup they're, the, for the U.S., they're going to need to be a member of the PGA Tour, uh, excuse me, a member of the PGA of America, and they get that membership through being a member of the tour. Uh, I believe you know that the Europeans feel the same way, and so I don't I don't know that we can be more clear uh, kind of than that. Um, 
it's a little murkier, you know, in, in our, our championship. But you know, to play from a U.S. perspective, you also have to be a member of the of uh, the tour and the PGA of America to play in our championship, and and we don't see that changing. So, you know, the majors are uh, and the Ryder Cup are obviously a huge part of the ecosystem in the game. Um, I think that's part of their design, and and uh, we think it's a flawed part of their design to assume that that would be the case, um, because in our case, it's not the case. So that's hopefully pretty clear. I think, you know, I th look, I, I come from a world of disruption, and I think it's inevitable. <clears throat> I actually think it's healthy. I think that's what, you know, you either disrupt or you get disrupted, and that's what this is. Um, but, you know, uh, should it be a hostile takeover of the game, I think is, uh, is, 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 is way too far. And so they've created, you know, this conversation, which, by the way, isn't new, right? It's been around since, I think, 2014 in different forms. Uh, has created change, right? It's created, uh, it's created an alliance of the European Tour and the, and the PGA Tour, which we think is really healthy for the game. We, we encourage that, and I personally did, you know, had a lot of conversations with both sides, and, and we think that's very healthy to be even more coordinated than we have. It's created the Player Impact Program, right, which um, is a direct result of that. Um, and then I think, you know, so change is happening, um, and I think it's healthy change. Is it enough? I, I'm not sure yet. I don't know. I, I struggle with what they're solving for. You know, it, the game is not in crisis, right? Like the players, um, the game has never been better from a participation standpoint. Uh, I think the players have never been better served um, than they, they are right now. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, this is a member-owned tour. Both of them are, right? Like, and so they're for the benefit of the players. That, it, that's how it's designed. That's how we're designed, right? Like, that's my job, is to be a fiduciary for the game and a fiduciary for our members and leave the room better than I found it. And that's exactly what Jay and Keith and Guy, who's standing behind you, are, you know, are doing every day. Um, if you think about what they've done over the years, whether it be the FedEx Cup or, well, back to Dean Beeman and creating, you know, the best pension plan on the planet, uh, and then, you know, FedEx Cup, those are all designed with the players in mind. And so you're going to have a great life if you can, if you can get here. Um, you're going to have a great life with, with a, you know, body that cares about you that is going to, you know, do everything they can to deliver that. If you introduce a financial element, that all changes, right? You know, I've, li again, lived in that world, right? And, um, you yeah, know, there has to be an exit. There has to be a profit. There has to be shareholders. There has to be a lot of things that change, you know, that dynamic of, of non-for-profits doing the right thing and always thinking about the game first and their players. And um, I think you just got to be careful sort of what you wish for. Um, I don't, you know... If that's a better way to watch a game, if a team format or, or you know, less players, you know, we should talk about that, you know, sort of as they should talk about it as an industry and, and think about whether there's better ways to conduct tournaments. But, um, but I don't think anything's, you know, hugely broken. Um, and so I'm not sure, you know, what the solve is for totally. Um, and other than, you know, uh, an outside body trying to disrupt and get into the game in a way that I'm, I don't think is in the best interest, long-term interest of the game. Should we also be careful, careful or mindful of where the money is coming from? Yeah, I think very mindful. Um, and uh, uh, I think, you know, enough said, but I think, you know, very, very mindful. Um, and, you know, money's money, right? And so money needs to have a return and have, you know, all those things that are, that are associated with it. Um, but some money is better than other money, and um, and if the only weapon you have is money, you know you're going to keep. <laughs> that's what you're going to lead with, right? And I think that's, you know, what's going on. And I don't think, um, particularly for younger players, they're going to have 20-year career out here. I, I just don't think they're going to be better off um, in that format than they already are. I, I, just, I honestly I look, and I've talked to a bunch of them, as you can imagine, and, you know, you look them in the eye and you just say, you know, be careful what you wish for, right? Um, because, you know, short-term gain, it feels good for a little while, but, you know, long-term gain is, is what makes lives. We're still at the Ocean Course taking questions. Uh, Mike number 11. Alex? 
Not sure where to start there. <laughs> Can you speak into the mic, Alex? Yeah, you, you said um, about disruption. Uh, you guys just signed a deal with uh, IMG Arena, which is gambling. Of course, we're at a state where we're having a, U uh, a PGA Championship and we can't gamble here, so we can't bet on this week. Are you looking at places where you've picked championships to go and working towards getting that changed to support what your efforts are on the gambling side? Yeah, well, uh, I'd say two things. I should have mentioned in my opening, we're really excited about that partnership with IMG Arena and the tour, right, who's doing a lot of the data. We think it's, I think, personally, and I think we all think it's going to be great for the game. You know, we talk about new entries from a participation perspective, but also from a, you know, viewer, viewership. And if we're, you know, if you look at, just look at what's happened in fantasy football and DraftKings and all these things that are creating games within a game. So you look at cricket internationally, which, you know, the, the, a lot of it is around, uh, is around the betting part of it is, is creates a, a lot of that interest. And so um, I'm for anything that grows the game. I'm for anything that makes it better. Obviously, we want it to be regulated. We want it to do well, which is why we have great partners. Um, and so I'm, I'm at, we're all excited about it. And I think it, I think it can really be a growth engine for uh, viewership and hopefully participation as well. Um, you know, and, and I've seen it firsthand in my 20-somethings, my kids and their friends, and, you know, that, that's, that's what they like to do. <laughs> it's happening in the stock market right now, right? Like, that's, that's also what gamification has is, is kind of happened. So I think that's all good. In terms of, you know, finding states, it's all happening pretty fluidly. And frankly, we're committed, you know, pretty far out on our championships, not, not our, our, certainly our, you know, our, our men's majors. Um, so we really don't have a lot of flexibility. Um, if we did, I'm not sure that would be a huge factor in what we're doing. I think, I think it's, you know, again, this is a personal opinion, not the PGA, but, you know, I think it's going to happen state by state. It's just, you know, it's too, uh, uh, it, it's too valuable to a state to, to not do it, and I think it will become the norm as opposed to the exception as states figure it out. And to predict 10 years out, you know, which states are going to have it or not, you know, that's pretty hard. That's beyond my pay grade. So we're not, we're not, you know, picking states by that, but uh, we're excited about the, the trend. Just one other question. Could you see the PJ of America lobbying legislatures in places where you are having tournaments to try to get this changed? Uh, probably a bridge too far. You know, that's not our job, right? We're, we're, we hold championships and we grow the game and serve our members and... Um, if we thought it, you know, added something to our members um, by adding something to our championships, I, I guess we could get our head around it. If there was an industry effort, we'd be a part of it. Um, but I don't think we'd drive that. You agree with that, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. I think, Alex, we've got bigger, you know, regulatory things that we're looking at that, <clears throat> that affect the, the golf industry. You know, water rights on the West Coast and relief efforts for different golf courses have been you know, left out of different relief bills in the past and things of that nature. So uh, our efforts from a lobbying standpoint are a little more concentrated on those areas right now, but absolutely sets right. I mean, if it, if it is a push for the industry uh, and our other partners and other associations, it's absolutely something we look into, just not a high priority right now. At the Ocean Course on mic number seven, please. Seth, obviously last year was a one-off, but how has the move to May strengthened this championship? That's a great question. You know, look where we are, right? Um, we think this is a very different experience in May, frankly, than it would have been in August, right? Kerry should speak to that. But, I mean, we had a great event here in August, but you do get some rain and probably a little less wind. Um, course conditions probably aren't quite as good. Uh, we think it, you know, and I'll let Kerry jump in because he's, he's, he's lived it. Um, you know, it obviously shuts out certain parts of the country, uh, which is disappointing, but there's no perfect date for that. Um, and... Uh, and we think it opens more than it closes. Um, and so, and we think the cadence of the schedule is just better. It's better for fans. I think it's better for players, though. Obviously, it's exhausting for them to, you know, go April, May, June, July. Um, and, and, you know, and then if this year you get an Olympics and then you've got a Ryder Cup and you've got a FedEx Cup in there. Uh, you know, that's a long, a long grind. Um, but as far as creating fan and, and engagement and, um, and how it should work and how it's given some breathing room to, to the Ryder Cup and, you know, Olympic years are a little different, but to the, to the Ryder Cup and to President's Cup and to FedEx Cup, we think it's a better, a better schedule for, for the players. 
But Kerry, you might want to. Yeah, add no, one hundred percent agree. I think Seth touched on everything, but certainly in warmer climates, it, it's more temperate for spectators and for all of us to be here. Golf course conditioning wise, it's the start of the season in most of the country, so that really helps our PGA members to promote the game and you know get their clubs excited about golf. So yeah, we love it. Uh, and you get a bit of more breeze in May than we do in August, so what's not to like? Yeah, Kerry made a great point. It's a, it's a great chance for us to to tell our story, right? As Jim talked about our 20 and sort of what we do, right? That we do this one week a year. We do the rest 52 weeks a year, and our chance to kind of light the fire for the game in May is pretty significant, right? Yeah, Seth's right. It's shining a spotlight on the work that our 28,000 members are doing through junior programs and our PJ Hope program and make golf your thing. It's kicking off as Kerry and, and Seth both said, a lot of the country is just opening up to golf because of the weather in April and May. So it's a great opportunity for us to really promote the game and promote the programs that our PJ members are running throughout the country. Thank you. Andrew on mic six, please. Kerry, given how long and difficult this course is, what's a uh, realistic time to get threesomes and twosomes around, and what steps will you be taking to make sure uh, players keep moving along? Yeah, I think the pace of play is always, uh, you know, concern, 156-player field. Uh, but we do have 11-minute intervals, as we did at uh, Harding Park last year, which certainly helped the flow of play. Uh, I think... The, the length of the course itself on its own, I don't think is that big of an issue as if the wind blows. And obviously then, you know, as a lot takes a little more time to determine clubs, etc. but the distance measuring devices will certainly help that potentially. Um, but no, we have a, a PGA of America rules committee and including some PGA tour rules officials and we'll be out monitoring the pace of play as we do every PGA championship. and very hopeful that the pace will be reasonable. And what's time power? The time power is 4.47, I think. And again, with a full field, you have two hours and 12 minutes of tee times. So 2.20 is about the quickest the lead group can play. So that's 4.40, and so I feel very comfortable. And is there a chance you'll play the course at your full length, or uh, do you plan to move some of the tees up every day? It'll totally depend on Mother Nature and make that decision each morning as we set it up. But hopefully it'll be fun and fair. Doug on mic three. Kerry, kind of as a follower, what Joel was asking about the, about the move to May, um, you've got three of your biggest championships, Ryder Cup notwithstanding, in a six-week period. Is that, is that too much to take on? Is that, how much stress does that create? Uh, having the three Nothing's major Nothing's too much for Kerry. <laughs> so, <laughs> having our three major championships, uh, certainly, We've had to adjust our staffing model a little bit, but I have such a fantastic staff who work for us at each of the championship venues, both the KPMG Women's PGA, the KitchenAid Senior PGA, and our PGA Championship, that you know we're a team and everyone you know gets into it. And you know we go straight from here to Tulsa next week, and we're ready. We're up. We have a daily call with Tulsa, and you know. Yes, it's challenging, but that's our job, and w we expect each of them to be the very best championships we can make, and hopefully the players will enjoy all three of them just as much as we enjoy putting them on. If you get a player who plays all three of them, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, Seth, I, maybe I've missed the memo or, or didn't pay attention to this, but, but when you talk about this exclamation point, for hopefully for the, for the Ryder Cup, have you begun ticket sales and... and how do you mesh that with, yeah. with um, the confidence level of being a full, yeah. full spectator venue? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer that question. So the ticket sales, we were sold out, Doug, uh, as of a year ago, right. <laughs> which was yeah. great news. Obviously, then we postponed it, and we offered all ticket holders and corporate uh, purchasers the opportunity to you know, either stay in or, or not um, for 2021 for the playing of it in 2021. And um, so the vast majority of the ticket holders and the corporates remain in and ready to go with the PGA Championship. We are working with the county uh, and the state uh, of Wisconsin and have submitted our COVID protocol plan, which has um, 
Seth mentioned, continues to change and evolve every day. But we're hopeful that by September we will be able to have full attendance. And um, you know, if it were today, we could not, based on where COVID numbers are. But certainly, with the vaccine and the numbers coming down, we are very hopeful and optimistic that we will be able to have a full attendance. Did you ever put a number on that full attendance? Uh, no. Are you going to? No, it's, we're sold out, which is good news. <laughs> <laughs> You've known Carrie for a long time, Mr. Ferguson. We have a question from Ann on uh, mic number 10. Yeah, I was going to ask what you just answered. I'll ask you another one about range finders, um, allowing the range finders here for the first time. What went into that decision? And do you really think it does speed up play? Uh, yeah, distance measuring devices, as I say, two years ago, the USGA and the RNA made it part of the rules of golf that they were allowed. Uh, for a number of years, we've been using it as a local rule for our PGA member championships. Uh, and we just felt the board uh, talked about it at length, uh, actually over for about 18 months yeah. uh, at least, talking about using it. And we feel it's the right time for the game to to use them. All the information that you can get from a distance measuring device, including some that you're not allowed to use this week, the players have and the caddies have in their yardage book. So the gradient changes, they're already in the yardage book, so you know that they're not getting any more information than they don't already have, but hopefully for balls that may be hit astray, being able to use it would save time of the caddy having to walk into the middle of the fairway, find a sprinkler, pace back, just to get the yardage to the hole. So we do think, I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, balls hit wide will save time, but, you know, for the general balls in the fairway, probably won't. Um, and it's new to the players and new to the caddies, so any improvement may not be seen this year or in the first you know, few weeks of trying it or few years of trying it if we're the only ones. But ultimately, or hopefully, I think down the line, it, it could show an improvement in pace. Something you'll use going forward every year? I think that's a our intent. Yeah, the board, yeah. when the board made that decision, the intent was for, for this to stay as a rule, not to try it for one year or just a couple of events. Our intent is that this will be introduced and be part of our championships moving forward. The only other thing I'd add is that, you know, these, every, the generations are growing up using them, right? So this is, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily the case, and it is now, right? So it makes a lot of sense, in my view. We're watching the clock, ladies and gentlemen, as we have more interviews coming in. Uh, but we'll go to microphone number 11 with Alex. Yeah, two things. One, Kerry, the captain's agreement uh, between the two captains for the Ryder Cup, when does that get uh, negotiated and signed? Uh, it's an ongoing process, and uh, hopefully probably the next uh, few weeks, I would say. There's a couple of things, you know, the order of play has to be determined by the home captain, which is included in the captain's agreement. So I think once uh, sort of encouraging Steve to make that decision so that we can operationally make s some decisions, and that's incorporated into the captain's agreement. And uh, so hopefully the next few weeks. Are, are alternates in that discussion? We have talking about the whole COVID situation. Uh, we have not agreed on what the solution will be, but we are th potentially going to put some wording in the captain's agreement um, in the event of COVID, but that's not final. It's just, and that's a little bit also of some of the holdup for it. All right, and, and Seth, um, you mentioned about uh, the championship being a little more difficult to deal with with this whole premier golf league kind of thing versus the Ryder Cup. Could you see a situation where you would specifically uh, exclude past champions in the criteria for getting into the PGA Championship if a, a premier golf league got off the ground? Well, it, you know, it's not specific to that, but if you're not a member of the PGA of America and you're U.S., you're, you're, you're not eligible, right? Mm -hmm. Kerry, I believe that's right, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're a past champion? Yeah, you have to be a PGA of America member for a U.S. Uh, citizen. Right. So it's not, it's not like we put it in to combat it. It's, it's our bylaw, right? 
Okay. And we'll zoom out to our uh, final question, probably from New York, potentially. Uh, Jay, unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Uh, Carrie, when I was speaking earlier this year with Jeff Stone, he told me that there's now rye rough uh, in May instead of the normal rough that you had last uh, last time you were there in 2012. Can you please tell us a little bit how differently the rough will play and what do you think the cost of rough is going to be for somebody who hits it in there? So... Um... I think every year here at the Ocean Course, they oversee during the winter uh, with ryegrass. And obviously in May, some of that ryegrass is still present in what is now predominantly past pollen grass. Uh, and you know, to be honest, the rough is not growing that quickly. I think Jeff has not mown it for over three weeks. And it's not growing that quickly. But our hope and intent is that, and, and I think we're seeing that, you're getting a mixture of lies, but there's a lot of balls are sitting up, which will potentially give you a sort of a flyer lie, and the, which is obviously difficult to control. And in an ideal world, that's what we would like to see. The intent's not to make it so thick and so deep that the player just has to hack it out. And yes, there may be one or two lies that get that, but I've thrown balls this morning, last night, and it, it's, it, it's just about where we want it to be. So could not be happier, and as I said, Jeff Stone and his crew have just done an unbelievable job in preparing what is just a fantastic golf course. Just to make you feel better, uh, Kerry, I had dinner with a major champion last night and said, how's the rough? And he said, oh, it's rough. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a factor. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, have a terrific week. Thanks for joining Thanks us. Thanks for coming. Thanks for all you guys do.